telling stories between From oceans to airwaves, you know what I mean Saddle up for the midnight rodeo Today I'm chatting with Beth Rawls and we are talking about the internet, specifically the role of the influencer. You couldn't see it, but I just used inverted commas there. (laughs) Thanks for joining me, Beth. I must say it is a real thrill for me to have a fellow redhead on the podcast. (laughs) Yes. Well, influence is an interesting term, actually, for me, because it's something that I'm always like, it has a lot of connotations Mm -hmm. around that word, which I often find difficult. (laughs) Yes. Just because it seems like someone who's an influencer is someone who does nothing. And it's not, I mean, I don't feel like I particularly influence people, although I do have an internet presence and often people will put me in that box. It's something that I often try and avoid, that word. Yeah, no, I feel you. It's similar to me, the word luck, the word fame. These are words that have a lot of gray area to them. What does it actually mean? But what I will Mm -hmm. say is you're someone that has a YouTube channel with over 400 thousand subscribers but i want to go back first because like anything it begins with just one so take me back to where this whole online journey began for you well i had actually done a little bit of youtube stuff before just for fun so myself and my friends used to make silly videos all the time and that would just be it and no one ever watched them and actually it was after working with you on um silver seas um i was working as a musical director for a cruise ship company and after that i was like right well i could do with getting a few more pupils again vocal coaching students and at the time i'd been super super busy with working as a musical director and it kind of petered away a little bit so I thought right I'll do some videos maybe some people will come along and get some lessons and in the first week I had got two new pupils from it and I thought oh fantastic I'll do some more and a couple of weeks later one of these videos just went viral and that was it it went viral weirdly in the Philippines and it really really took off and it was actually a massive accident to begin with it was just meant to be something to kind of advertise singing lessons something that I enjoyed doing I always love looking at singers and finding out more about them so it was it really ever meant to be this big mm. and now obviously you have released videos every day i just was fixated on the beginnings of starting it from silly little videos and i think people try too hard these days and i loved years ago when i would make little silly videos one that springs into my mind we did in high school a video called 101 uses for a ping pong bat it's a horrible <laughs> video it's horrible but it's all about creativity whereas i think people are focused on the wrong aspects these days and they're looking to as we mentioned before become an influencer and again what does that mean but you are focused on actually helping people you want to help people learn from top vocalists and your whole brand beth roars utilize Utilizes real world skills that you have as a vocal coach, as a musical director, as a performer. And I know that since doing the YouTube thing, you've also pivoted into podcasting with a new show called Good yes. Job with Beth Ross. Tell us a bit about that. Well, my whole thing on the YouTube channel was about finding out what makes singers unique, what techniques they use or stylistic elements that they use that make them themselves. And actually, the more I got into it, the more I became interested in them as people, because actually that is what defines their voice. Your personality is so interconnected with how you attack or approach approach the voice so I just was fascinated by these musicians who had done well and I was like let's chat to them at first I just got a few friends who worked in the industry and eventually I started sending out some emails to people I actually recently interviewed Sinead O'Connor who is like one of my heroes and I could not believe that she said yes but she did and it's just fascinating to hear those people's life stories and how they came to be the people that they are I think you touched on a really important gem there that I'm going to zoom in on now and that is the idea that if you don't ask you don't get but I think Mm -hmm. by the same token and would you agree with this that you have to give evidence of strong quality 
and uh, good intentions before these higher status people will come along with you on the journey. I'm finding it with this particular journey I find myself on that Mm -hmm. I'm able to, now that I have evidence that we are doing something for the right reasons and we have a quality product, people are more willing to come and engage with you. Would you say that's correct? You always have to start from somewhere. And, you know, the YouTube videos started as quite terribly filmed and everything always starts off like that. And that is fine. But at that point, I would never have been able to get these big guests on the channel for sure. But in the first few episodes, when I only had 30,000 subscribers, which I say only at the time, I was like, oh my God, 30,000 is so many. But yeah, at that point, I was asking friends who are in the industry. But as that grew and as I developed the production quality of my YouTube channel, I could then say to guests, well, look, I've done this already. I've made this nice. I have produced it well, so the podcast should be the same. What I find interesting about your particular role on the internet is that you have utilized your offline skills and helped you succeed online. What I'm wondering is that Mm. in turn, has your online work changed your offline business and your offline life as well? What other doors have you managed to open? I mean, everything goes back to my coaching but even the fact that I'm doing reaction videos and I am listening to new singers all the time from that perspective it has made my coaching so much better but it's opened up online lessons with people across the entire world like I'll be teaching someone in Sweden and then in America and Australia and Mexico just across the entire world and I never thought I would be doing that and that has been particularly handy in in current times because I've been able to move everything online very very easily even my London lessons of course right now everything's online but that's been very easy for me to do so everything has really really helped in both my coaching and just the practicality of online in life these days. Now you're helping others through these videos and uncovering the quality of people's voices and the uniqueness. However, we mm-hmm. must go to ourselves as well. And I wonder if through these videos that you have put out, have you managed to improve your own voice as well? Yes, absolutely. I think you will always learn from listening to the greats. And there's so many things that I'm like, oh, I'd love to add that into a song. And also I have been doing a few singing videos on my channel. So it means that it gives me a reason to practice and make sure I'm keeping my practice as a singer up to date. So yes, I think everything really informs. And the more that I'm teaching as well, the more I'm learning about other people's voices, it always, always helps my voice. And it's inspiring for me. If I see my pupil improving and I haven't done that work myself, then I feel like a bit of a fraud. So it's inspiring when I see like someone come back and they've practiced all week and they're so much better than the week before. I'm like, right, well, I better get down to my scales and get back to my singing practice. Well, social media is a (laughs) part of everyday life now for most people. And up next, we're going to chat about the good the bad and the ugly of life on the web. You're listening to the Midnight Rodeo with Thomas Armstrong Robley. (laughs) There is a dark side to the internet as well, and we don't like to talk about it very often, but I (laughs) felt like there was a great opportunity to discuss it here because whether it's Snapchat or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or Tumblr or MySpace or Bebo, you remember that one? Yes, yes. Well, there is definitely an ugly side. And when it first blew up, I found it really difficult. I think I did actually find the the bad comments that difficult in some ways. I actually found the amount of people watching overwhelming. And there was a point where I hadn't really worked on or understood what I was doing that people wanted to watch. And I hadn't upped my production quality. I hadn't got lights and all these things. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's so many people watching me and I don't know how to deal with this. I remember sitting in a pub with my boyfriend at the time and being like, I don't know what to do. This is completely overwhelming. It seems like a good thing, but I I don't know how to deal with this. What if it's not good enough? 
what if everyone hates it? What if everyone just gives me the thumbs down? And actually, not that many people were. And then there are the horrible comments. Mm. Um, especially, there's a lot of, I think, especially being a woman, there's a lot of comments on appearance, mm -hmm. uh, which can be quite disheartening. Especially when you're trying to put across educational content and all you're getting is comments about your appearance. I find that really difficult to begin with. But as I've gone on, I don't read the comments that much. I read some of them, but I mostly just, I feel like if someone really wants to get in touch with me, they'll send me an email and there are ways to definitely get in touch with me. And I tend to read those more. And those tend to be people who are respectful and nice. And or even if they are critical, they are in sometimes people will send me information about a certain artist, which is actually really lovely. So I just try and avoid those comments now because it's just not good for your head. It's all about balance, you know. And as I said, I wanted to explore the polar opposites, I suppose, in a way. And you mentioned mm. comments right then. And I wonder if you could rack your brain for me. I know you don't read them too much now, but. Can you remember, this is a three-parter, uh, could you remember potentially the best comment you've received, the worst, and oh. has there been one that has maybe, I don't know, just confused you, disgusted you, or just made you laugh? My favourite comment was, I could watch Beth Rohr's review a cabbage. I really enjoyed <laughs> that one. Bad ones, uh, I mean, there's often ones about appearance. And actually, the ones that I find the most troubling are ones where people are trying to be nice, mm. but they're actually just commenting on how I look or which is not what the videos are about. I think if someone's really horrible, it's kind of like, well, whatever, you're just being horrible. Yeah. But when it's like slightly backhanded and they're like, I like you, but it's like, Oh, okay, well, that one's worse. But I'm very lucky that I also get lots of lovely comments. I had a really dramatic one, and this was one of my singing videos. It's actually horrible, but nice. I mean, sent me this email about saying that they were super, super depressed and were really, really suicidal, and that they listened to the song and that made them rethink their suicidal thoughts. Oh, wow. Which I was like, Oh, wow. I mean, I didn't mean to put out this video for that purpose, but I'm glad I managed to help in any way. Yeah, it's terrifying. So that's obviously amazing to hear that, like, just putting out a song could do that. But to know that you wield that much, I suppose, power over somebody in that moment is its an incredible, as you said, it's a beautiful thing to be able to help. But you wonder that the internet does have a power and could it go the other way as well? And it, it is troubling to think mm. uh, about that. And these videos are maybe three minutes to the viewer and that seems like nothing. But as a content creator like you or or anyone that's doing the podcasting, the YouTube thing, we know that there's an awful lot of time that goes into a high-quality piece of footage. Could you give mm -hmm. us a glimpse into the week for you? Oh, I have a busy old week right now. Reaction videos now are taking me less time because I have got into a flow with them, but if I want to do any other type of video, like singing video or just a general chat video, it takes me a lot of time. So... Each of my reaction videos, for example, I will have to research the person that I want to react to. So that takes me a bit of time. And I then will go up and shoot the video. And now, luckily, but I didn't used to, but I send it off to an editor and then it comes back and forth for reviews. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also teaching five days a week for all days. And I have the podcast, so it's either interviewing or editing that. There's just a lot going on. Every day is a little bit different. I do have my kind of regular teaching slots, but apart from that, in terms of whether it's podcast or YouTube things, it just really depends on what needs to be done. And the important thing about YouTube, or especially the algorithm, is that you keep regular content going. So the algorithm will boost you if you continue to put out content, but if you slow down, it tends to then forget you a little bit. So it's really important to at least be putting out little clips of stuff as much as possible. Well, you began content, as you mentioned, as a tool to enhance the work you were doing with teaching. And mm. I think there's a misconception, particularly major social media with younger people, that your job online is all you do. Where, as we've just mentioned, you're teaching a five-day week a lot of the time, and mm -hmm. it's just not the case. I wanted to finish our little conversation and discuss a little bit of public 
public service, I suppose, because there's a lot of people, as I said, they're getting 27 likes on a post and they think they're the next Kim K or Cardi B or or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if you could give some advice to these people that are hoping to become a content creator or a YouTuber or a podcaster, because it is easy for people to do now with the technology being so readily available, what would it be? I think it would be... Do base your YouTube or your content around things that you love. And it doesn't have to be something like coaching or something that is so education based. It can be something silly. However, you can't bank on it being successful. So Mm -hmm. do it because you love it. And if you somehow hit the right thing like I managed to do, then it will be successful. But if you're just going for success in itself, then there's no point. You just have to find the thing that you love and keep on going towards that thing. And eventually something will come out of it. But yeah, don't do it just for success. Yeah, it's hilarious. The people that strive for success do not succeed. And the people that go for, you know, passion, go for quality, they're the ones that reach success. There's a great, I suppose, an irony there. But it's needless to say that whether you think you are an influencer or an online presence or whatever it may be, you have absolutely rather succeeded online. And as a result, mm. you've enhanced your success offline as well. Uh, and it has been wonderful to chat about the world of YouTube. And I suppose in a way, give a little bit of advice to those people that think it is easy. And I suppose to the yeah, older not- generation that are not interested in uh, in creating content, but certainly are people that digest content, it is good for us to, I suppose, pull the curtain back a little bit and Tell them that a lot of work does go into this stuff because, as I said, there is misconceptions that the life of creator of content is an easy one. Well, I guess people don't understand it. And because you can do it completely by yourself these days, it seems like it's easy. Like you've just made a video and it's gone viral and then you made some money. But that's not the case. You know, it takes a lot to find a formula or find a way to make successful videos. Then you have to have all the equipment. You have to learn how to record everything correctly. You have to take the time to do this. You have to research. You have to think about what you're talking about. There's just so much that goes behind it. And now I have editors working for me and producers and it's not me. There's a team of people now. But so often YouTube channels will have four or five people working behind the scenes, just keeping things running. And I think people don't realize that. No, not at all. They don't because we only believe what we see, you know, and obviously they see a video that is just you a lot of the time or you and a guest Mm -hmm. in a podcast studio and they're not aware. And I suppose that's the magic of it, I know, you know, in, in a movie, the magic is it's raining in this movie, but it's not actually raining. It's a guy with a host pipe, but we don't see that and we don't believe in that guy being there. Mm-hmm. And that is a wonderful thing. And obviously 2020 has been very interesting and we're seeing a lot more online content being put out. Has it affected what you do or have you just you know, stay the course and uh, continue to put out quality content? It has affected in some ways because monetization has changed. I think because of stock market crashes. So per video at the moment, I'm definitely getting less money than I did previously. Mm -hmm. However, I am still just going to continue doing what I'm doing. I have some ideas, actually. I'm taking a little bit of time off in August and then I want to adapt. And I think it's less to do with this. It's just more to do with me as a person that once I do one thing and I find it, I want to expand and grow. My first thing has been the podcast, but now I'm looking at trying to integrate more different types of videos so that it's not completely reaction videos. Although I will keep them going because they are so popular and I still do really enjoy them. But I think it's important to always adapt and grow whether or not it's in this uh, crazy, crazy time that we're living in. Well, I think I speak for myself, certainly, knowing the amount of work you've put in since, as you mentioned, just under three years ago it's been now. And Mm -hmm. also I speak probably for your viewers, your loyal followers that watch your videos every day and saying that you probably do deserve a bit of a break, but I'm glad before you took a break, you uh, took a moment to come and chat with me and I suppose shed a little bit of light on what is not very explored a lot of the time. (laughs) 